And we're live. On today's episode of Story Junkie, we have David Shiner. David, say hello. Hello, everybody. Nice uh, I'm going to do my utmost best to introduce David. Um, he's very well accomplished in, 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 in the space of theater. Um, he started as a street performer, did that for many years. Uh, he was actually in three different circuses, um, Ron Cali, uh, the Nice Swiss, Na Swiss National Circus, and, of course, Cirque du Soleil um, in Canada. Um, he was involved in uh, HBO's Lorenzo's Oil and The Silent Tongue, and he was cast in The Cat in the Hat. And what he's most well-known for is um, directing uh, Cusa, um, a performance by Cirque du Soleil, which started in 2007 and is now showing in five different continents. So, David, I, I hope I did my best to introduce you. Um, yeah, how'd you I do? Forgot, you forgot one of the most important things, my collaboration with Bill Irwin on a show called Full Moon on Broadway that we did. We opened in 1993 and played consecutively uh, through 1997. Um, we opened a new show in February off-Broadway called Old Hats, which is moving to Broadway in September. So okay. my collaboration with Bill... Um, yeah, and uh, was that the was that the one that lacked dialogue? That was a silent show, correct? That was all silent. Yes. Okay. Well, we're gonna get into that. We have some questions. We've noticed a, a couple of things you've been involved is um, they lack words. So so we'll get into that later. But to start, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your childhood? Um, where were you born? Where'd you come from? Um, well, I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, big family. I have seven brothers and sisters. My father was a truck driver back then. Um, and um, we, in 19, so I was born in 1953. We moved to Colorado in 1963. And um, so I spent time in Colorado. Uh, we moved then to Washington, D.C. I spent time in Washington, D.C. We moved back to Colorado. Um, then we moved to Virginia. I spent time in Virginia. Um, in, the, in the interim, my father had um, studied to become a, a computer programmer. Um, so we moved around quite a bit, but I eventually settled in Boulder, Colorado, and um, was working as a uh, carpenter there. Um, I built houses for ten years, um, five years in Virginia, five years in, in Boulder. I did study um, theater in Virginia uh, at Christopher Newport College for a couple years, um, but. I, I don't know why, but I didn't continue my studies and uh, continued working as a carpenter. Um, you know, I, there's not a lot to say about my childhood. I mean, I don't want to take up too much of your time talking about my childhood. Um, it was just great having seven brothers and sisters. I mean, um, it was a, a big family. Where are you, uh, where are you in, in, right in the middle? Right, 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 in in the middle. middle I, right in the middle. I also have a twin sister. Um, you know, I, I knew that I wanted to be in, involved in the performing arts at the age of 10. Mm -hmm. And the first clown routine I ever did was I was 10 years old. And it was for a PTA meeting, I think, teacher, parent-teachers conference. I put and was there something, uh, someone in your family or someone in your immediate network that kind of inspired you to, to get involved that young in, in theater? No, no. I saw a Jerry Lewis movie, and uh, I laughed my head off. And, uh, you know, for... For a kid to see a grown-up acting like a kid was just uh, hysterical. So I knew at that moment that I wanted to uh, be involved in the performing arts. Um, I knew I wanted to be funny. And I think that's what got me through school. I didn't particularly like school that much. Um, but I was a, a good, you know, I was, a, I was funny in class. I was the class clown. And my teachers liked me. Um, so they, <laughs> they let me get by somehow. Did, but, they, did, uh, did they see the potential within? Is that why they let you get by, or were you, were you that funny? They were just like, okay, this, this guy's too good. We'll just let him be. No, 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 no. I mean, you know, I mean, there's always a limit, right? There's always a limit, but I knew when to draw the line. And uh, But school wasn't my thing. I, I don't know why, um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I, as I said, I... I, I Worked as a carpenter for 10 years, and I enjoyed that very much, building houses. And then I saw a clown on the street one day in Boulder, Colorado. That was in 19, uh, must have been 1979, 1978. And um, he was working. They had just built the Boulder Mall, and um, walking mall, and he had money in his hat. And I thought, man, that's, wow. 
<laughs> I'm glad that. And I went out on the street the next day, I think, or on the weekend, and I was awful. I was just awful. I tried to do some funny stuff, and you know, people would just walk by and ignore me. Then I bought a book on mimes, a book called uh, by a mime. Uh, his, his name was Claude Kipnis. Wonderful book. And I started studying all the technique of mime. And I don't know, you know, I just started working on the streets and just continued at it during the whole summer. And I, uh, I just had this innate talent for it and um, started getting big crowds and um, was making more money on the streets than I, than I did as a carpenter. Really? And then I, then I met a juggling duo called Dr. Hot and Neon, and they had just come from Paris. And this was in the summer of uh, 1980, and they said, man, you got to go to Paris. The street arts are awesome. You can work the streets anywhere. The money's good. The audiences are great. So I literally, um, that was the, that must, no, that was the spring of 81. Um, and a, a month later, I had packed my bags and moved to Paris. I had uh, about $400 in my pocket. Literally went to Paris with um, a couple suitcases, my costume, uh, some makeup, and um, started working the streets. And um, the places to work in Paris were Beaubourg, Georges Pompidou. Um, Saint Germain de Pré and Leal, and uh, I started working at the Georges Pompidou. Um, did you have a Did you have a contact in Paris? I mean, did you Did you go nothing. to meet someone who was going to take you under their wing, or did you have a destination where you were? Going? I had nothing. I had nothing. All I had was a couple suitcases. That was it. I showed up in Paris. Got I got a, a room in a crummy hotel, a dumpy little place. And the first night there, I thought, what in the hell am I doing? This is, <laughs> this is just insane. You don't know anybody. You've got nothing. You don't have a job. You've got nothing. And uh, I, I don't know. You know. I just went out on the streets the next day. And, um, uh, you know, at that time in 1981, the street arts had been around for a few years, but it was very fervent. And uh, there were some great street artists and some really good people. And the, the Parisians loved it. The police left you alone. Uh, Parisians loved it. They thought it was really romantic and exciting to, uh, you know, have street artists. And um, so, um, you know, in the beginning it was tough, of course, um, because there was kind of a, a small mafia around the Beaubourg. You know, guys that had been working there for a while, and if you were a newcomer, they didn't really welcome you that in, in much of a friendly way. <laughs> But I started getting such huge crowds, and I was my style of performing was so outlandish and so um, just aggressive, and it was pure anarchy, really. I, I was dressed as a clown, and I was an anarchist. <laughs> I I did everything. I would stop traffic. I would, you know, I would uh, stop women with their children in, in in the carriage, baby carriage, and I'd buy the baby from the child and give the baby. <laughs> somebody else and I'd go up to these motorcycle gangs and try to start a fight with them and pretend you know take one of their leather jackets and pretend I was on my motorcycle I mean I would do anything and it was all improv it was all based on improv uh -huh. and um, in parallel to that I would work on my technique my movement because movement is really important in pantomime and um, I mean all you have to do is watch a, a film of Charlie Chaplin and you'll see how important movement is um, in silent acting. I call it silent acting because that's basically what it is. Um, you know, expressing emotions without words, uh, storytelling without words. But my improvisation was outlandish. It was something. You know, I broke all the rules. I I, I went. I I broke. The, I broke the boundaries, and people had never seen that before. Um, I would literally hit people over the head with my hat if I didn't like them. Um, <laughs> And, you know, sometimes I went too far, but I learned. I learned where to draw the line and um, to work with res as much respect as possible, for, you know, with people. Um, but the main thing was the technique and the improvisation. Um, I was doing it every day, so it was, it was getting stronger and stronger and stronger, and the crowds were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I would, you know, the hats that I would get after the shows were just great. I mean, they were full. And, uh, you know, after a performance like that, we call, you pass the hat. You take your hat and you pass it around. And um, 
So I ended up staying in Paris for three years, and I basically supported myself strictly just by working on the streets. And um, I became very accomplished performer in terms of my technique and improvisational skills and the style of movement that I developed and the style of the kind of character that I that I created. And there was a character that was, you know, pretty aggressive, um, impatient. He was cantankerous. Um, he could be very sweet, but he could also be, you know, really mean. But I managed to do it in a way that it didn't rub people the wrong way, you know. And like I said, it was what I did was outlandish. I, you know, this guy. I would sometimes I'd go out in the middle of the street with a raggedy Ann doll, in the middle of the street, stop the traffic first of all, and then walk the raggedy Ann doll across the street. And then the raggedy raggedy Ann doll would have a heart attack, and I'd <laughs> get that, give the raggedy Ann doll CPR. And people were honking the horn, yeah, get stupid fit, uh, you know, freaking out. I said, well, I, there's nothing I can do. The doll is having a heart attack, you know. And, or I take someone out of their car, put them in somebody else's car. Um, so I would mimic people. I became very good at mimicking people with very minimal movement. I could mimic someone's character. Um, but people had been doing that before I arrived. With, uh, you know, Mimes would follow people and just pick up their walks. When you when you said that you um your character was very aggressive and outlandish, um, was that was that character that you developed sort of a reflection of who you actually are, or was was that character someone totally different than who you are, and and there were well, two separate people? Well, it's interesting. You know, that's a, that's a complex question to answer because as an artist, when you're creating something, sometimes when you're creating something, it's coming from a very conscious part of you. And sometimes you're creating something that's coming from an unconscious part of you, some unresolved, unconscious emotion that needs to find a way to be expressed. And I think the aggressive character of mine was unconscious. It was, uh, I must have been a very angry guy back then. And, uh, but I was transforming that anger into, uh, into art. And I, I managed to get away with it, and I managed to do it in a way that really didn't um, hurt anyone. If I hurt anyone, it was myself by going too far every now and then. But, you know, he was a classic clown who wasn't nice, and that was just something really original. This is a clown. Normally clowns are nice and sweet and sad sap and, you know, and romantic. And this was a clown that was, man, he just, he was pissed off at everybody. <laughs> and, um, That's fantastic. And, you know, also we all have anger, too. You know, everybody has anger. Most of us don't like to show our anger or reveal our anger because um, um, we feel that um, uh, it's not appropriate. Or it's not appropriate. It's not a good thing to have. And, but we all have it, whether we are, you know, admit to it or not. And I think that's also part of the – that was part of the, um, um, the power of, of it. When people were watching it, they could see themselves in me. At least that disowned part, that shadow part of themselves, um, and uh, it worked well for me, you know, up to a certain point. And then at some point, I had to change and uh, go a little deeper. But um, the streets were, you know, I learned a lot. I wouldn't suggest anybody going and doing it. Um, it's a very hard way to to learn and a hard way to, you know, especially earn money. But in those days, it was different. Um, today, it's, it's, you know, times have changed. Um, back in those days, it was a, more of an innocent time. Um, now, yeah. you know, and a lot of people would go out in the streets now and, you know, and then, who didn't even belong there and uh, take up great spots. Uh, you know, people that couldn't sing or they weren't good clowns or bad jugglers or you name it. Everybody wanted to get in on the action and earn some money. Um, so it um, uh, it changed. I don't know what it is like today, but um, in those days. So what? Like, so so what happened from there? I mean, after you were you were on the streets for years performing, you saw success. Um, I mean, did you did you then go seek more of a, a a professional route, or did someone come find you and say this guy is brilliant? We need to get him off the streets and into the theater. Yeah. Well, it was something like that. Some guy. Um, saw me on the streets and uh, um, actually no I, I got off the streets I got tired of the streets 
um, during one of my shows, uh, something tragic happened, and I, I decided that I didn't want to do it anymore. Some guy had committed suicide. He jumped off the top of Babur and landed next to my show. And, um, you know, it was really tragic. It was uh, There were a lot of drug addicts um, that hung, hung around Babur. And um, so I decided that I just didn't want to do that anymore. It was a hard way of earning a living, and I, I got everything I needed out of it. And I joined a small circus, uh, Les Puis aux Images. Uh, Christian Taguet, um, this French guy, uh, owned this circus. And I spent about six months with this circus, a small little one ring, I think 500 seats. And um, Dominique Mauclair, um, who um, founded the Cirque de Demain, the Circus of Tomorrow, um, it's a festival that they hold. Um, they're still doing it. They hold each year in, uh, I believe it's February or January, um, for young circus artists. And he saw me in the Puizos Image and he said, look, you got to come and do this festival. You'd be great at it. So I did the festival, and, um, of course, at this festival are all the big circus directors from around the world attend this every year. And a man named Bernard Paul, uh, an Austrian man who had, a, at that time, probably the best circus in the world, Roncalli in Germany, and uh, he invited me to come and perform in his circus. So he gave me you know, a big chance, and I performed in his circus, and his circus was already um, a huge thing, and uh, so he took a big chance with me. Did you maintain your character, your persona, the, 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 the guy did. who I was did. performing on the I street? I did. I did. I had still had a lot to learn because I had to get off the streets and really uh, develop now the material for you know, a professional environment. So I had to change a lot. I had to, I had to figure out how to do it. And it was a one-ring circus, about 1,500 seats. And um, I was a, in sensation overnight um, because I improvised with people from the audience. And uh, I did a year there. And um, then I took a year off. And then I uh, went to the Swiss National Circus, KNI, did a year there. And um, then I took another year off, and that was 1987. And then a couple of years, I worked with an old partner of mine, Rene Bazinet. We put a two-man show together and toured through Switzerland and Germany. And um, Guy La Liberté, um, back in 1985, wanted me to join his circus. And um, I said, well, I'm not ready to go, to this, go back to the States yet. And... Um, uh, I went off and did my own thing, and then eventually he um, he came back to me and said, "Look, uh, I'd like you to join the show in 1990, our new show, uh, Nouvelle Experience." And I said, "Okay, I agreed to it." And it was a great um, collaboration. Um, in those days, you know, we all got to sort of put our two cents worth in, and um, it was great working with Guy and the whole team there. And we put to, we, we put together a great show, Nouvelle Experience. And again, I became a a sensation um, in America in the circus. But, you know, it's funny because the circus was never really, I never really planned on being in the circus. I always wanted to be in the theater. Mm -hmm. But um, I, did, I did the circus, and um, then when we were in New York in 1991, I met Bill Irwin, who had, was already a big star in America. Um, he uh, did a show called In Regard of Flight, um, which was just mind-blowing, uh, you know, a great, great, great clown. And I couldn't believe he was in the audience. I thought, Holy hell, Bill Irwin's here. i got to be good. i got to really be good tonight. And um, we met after the show, and, uh, and then the next day we went and had lunch together in the city, and uh, we struck up a friendship, and... Um, and about a year later, we got um, cast in a movie together, um, Silent Tongue, Sam Shepard's film. And um, we had a s couple scenes together, slapstick scenes. And the rehearsals were so awesome. It was so good, the electricity between us, that uh, I thought, man, we gotta, we got to work together. We absolutely have to work together. So um, we ended up creating a show together called Full Moon for Broadway which was a big hit on the Tony Award. Um, we now, when you say you've, uh, now, now when you say you created a show together, did you, 
slightly switch from uh, performing to writing, producing, directing? I mean, how did, how did that transition really occur? Well, it was just, you know, for me it was always uh, let's get together and see what happens. You know, I never saw stuff as a um, as myself as a producer or a writer or anything. I saw myself as an, as an artist that uh, just wanted to be creative and uh, had ideas. And um, when I was doing this film, my agent said that the Lincoln Center wanted me to perform um, at the Sirius Fun Festival. And I said, look, I don't want to do it alone. Let me, I'll ask Bill Orban if he wants to do it with me. And uh, the Red Clay Ramblers were also in the Sam Shepard film, this band, the Red Clay Ramblers. And I said, look, why don't we all just do this, do the weekend? The Ramblers can play the music, and Bill and I will put a show together. It was just on a lark. You know? Bill said, what are we going to do? Oh, my, oh, oh, shit, what are we going to do? I said, let's just have some fun. Let's see what, what comes out of it. So we did this weekend. It was in the summer. We did a weekend. We did a Friday and Saturday night, and it was just huge. The, the chemistry between us was like Laurel and Hardy. It was you know, Buster Keat, Chaplin. It was all the great early silent film comics. It was because that's who Bill and I, we worship those guys. And uh, we just, you know, we stumbled upon this great teamwork. And the Ramblers added a wonderful quality with their red, with their bluegrass music. Um, anyways, it was a big hit on Broadway. Um, so, you know, that's basically, I mean, uh, after Full Moon, um, I went back to work for Cirque du Soleil. I wrote and directed their show, Kuza which is still on tour. Um, where, did the, uh, where did the inspiration for Kuza come from? Well, Kuza for me was always, I always thought if I had, a, you know, if I could do a show for Cirque du Soleil, a, a big top show, what would I like to do? And that's the show I put together. Um, I wanted the show to focus really on the artistry. I didn't want a lot of high-tech stuff. I wanted great music, um, of course, good lighting, um, good clowns. Um, and I wanted, to, I wanted it to have a bit of a nostalgic feel to it. Um, I wanted to combine a little bit of the modern with the nostalgic, with the old. Um, and yeah, I was very, very, very happy with how it turned out. When, um, going back to when you were a, a street performer, David, and throughout your career, were you ever concerned or worried about um, not making it? Or, I mean, you mentioned no. that you were very successful pretty early on. Did you always just have confidence that, things would work out and it, it was never a, a big concern for you or did you ever feel sort of like lost I guess with what you were doing? Hold on to that question I just have to say goodbye to my guests I'll be right back. No problem. Oh, cool. See you guys. Hey, Pete. He's sitting cross-legged dude I love it. What? He's sitting cross-legged I love it. <laughs> so we can definitely just cut this part out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the questions we've got lined up are pretty good. Yeah. Okay. So, um, um, so my, so I guess yeah, it was just as a street performer, or throughout your maybe your earlier, the earlier part of your career, were you ever concerned or worried about you know what if this doesn't work out or what if I don't make it or that was that not a, a concern or thought for you ever? It wasn't a concern for me. I don't know why. I mean, I, I have more I have more of those kinds of concerns now. <laughs> really? Than back then, yeah. Um, and why is that? Well, because I think when you're young, you know, you want to achieve something. You have a vision. I always say that, you know, I teach also quite a bit here uh, in Munich at the um, Acting Academy. And I say to the students, you need to have a vision of where you want to be. You envision yourself, that's what I want to do. In the beginning when I was working the streets, I had a vision of myself as a great street artist. I wanted to be a great street artist. I wanted to be leave some kind of mark, and I wanted it to be, whatever I did on the streets, I wanted it to be really good. And then when I got in the circus, I had a vision of myself as a great circus clown. I wanted to try to find a way to really be good at that. Um, in the meantime, I was always trying to learn and, um, you know, uh, make my uh, get better at what I was doing. Not not just in terms of the technique, but in developing the character, developing um, 
new ideas, new routines. Um, uh, so you always had a vision that you were working towards and trying to accomplish. I had a vision I was working towards, and then you know, uh, and then Cirque du Soleil. I thought, wow, this is a modern circus. These guys are doing something very different. Um, and I had a vision for myself in that show, what I would do in that show. I had a vision. I saw myself uh, participating in, in the whole creative process. Um, and then eventually, you know, when I first saw Bill, because the first time I saw Bill Irwin, when I, you know, after uh, he saw me in Cirque du Soleil, I suddenly had the vision of, man, Bill Irwin, this guy has already done Broadway. He's already done Off-Broadway. He's already won, he won the... Uh, MacArthur Genius Award, you know, he's, uh, I thought if there's any guy I want to work with, it would be him because, not because he's won awards and he's been so successful, but that he's such a good clown. He was, he is so good. And I never, and I thought, man, that would be so cool if I could work with him. And I had it as a vision. I had it as a, you know, something in my head. And, uh, you know, I, I think when I had idea, I had ideas to do stuff, I never doubted it. I just went and did it. I didn't sit around and, and, and obsess about, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? I just did it. Mm -hmm. and, um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I didn't, do a lot of, I didn't do a lot of planning, everything. All the decisions I made were very impulsive, um, spur of the moment. But I always had a vision of myself and where I would be. So what would uh, what would what would the present day David Shiner go back and say to the mid twenty year old David? That's a good question. Um, I you would maybe say, just put some money in his hat and say keep going, or no? I would say the 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 biggest the biggest enemy we face is fear. Because fear is the one thing that will always try to pull us down, try to keep us from realizing our dreams, try to keep us from realizing the vision that we have for ourselves in our life. It's fear. Um, you know, all of us are born into the world with um, uh, certain pluses and certain minuses that we have. It's the bags, it's the baggage that we, we bring with us. And regardless of whether it's good or bad, you know, it's the cards that were dealt. And um, we have to learn to live with those things. I'm talking about human, our human weaknesses, our, 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 the things that were the strong parts of ourselves as, part, and as well as the weak part of ourselves. We need to work with both of them. And if we let the weaker part of ourselves get the upper hand, it starts to run the show. And then we're in less of a position to make real clear decisions about what our lives can be. So I would say to the young people is, is to be strong, um, know that life's not easy, everything's a battle. Um, most things are, are, are a fight. Um, you know, if you've been to university, you know how hard it is to get a degree. You have to study hard and you have to be disciplined and you have to, you know, you have to work at it. But to having a vision of yourself, of what you want to be in life, you know, I would say, as I look back in my own life, what's more important? Has it been the, the success that I've had in the physical world or the success I've had on a psychological, spiritual level? Um, I would say the psychological, spiritual, or mystical, whatever you want to call it, is much more important um, because we need to be, you know, uh, I've had success. I've achieved everything I dreamt of, of doing. And ultimately, we have to realize that that thing is not going to make you happy. Something else is... There's something else that's parallel to that that we should never forget, and that's the evolution um, and development of our psychological, spiritual beings, um, how we grow and how we face life and deal with all of the things that confront us on a daily basis. Um, human growth, you know, awareness, human awareness, uh, these are the things that, uh, that are really priceless. Um, who am I? What am I doing here? What's my purpose? 
you know, these are important questions that need to be answered. And there are answers. Um, I would say if you can have both, beautiful. It's great. Um, but worldly success is um, is not is not going to make life. Um, it's not what it's cracked up to be. Hmm. Human development, you know, the de the development of um, yourself as a human being, um, the amount of awareness, self awareness that you can. Um, uh, grow within yourself um, is, because I feel that's limitless learning what human you know what it means to be a human being is I think is an infinite process and that is so rewarding human growth you know um, you, and that always yeah I was gonna say do you, do you think a key piece of that is going after and pursuing the things that you're genuinely interested in well it depends I mean look uh, we can go and pursue something we're really interested in and somehow maybe it doesn't work out. What are you going to do then? You know, um, sometimes it's going to work out and sometimes it's not going to work out. But um, we should, you know, that doesn't mean we should give up on any level. We just keep, we, we can find something else and move towards that. But I think growing as a human being, if we're growing, we're facing our fears, we're trying to overcome our own weaknesses, we're trying to come to terms with um, deeper truths about life. These things, if we're pursuing that, the other things will automatically come. It's when we pursue success at the cost of our human development, um, then, then, then uh, life becomes very complicated. Do you think? Do you think there's a lack of that as an initiative in in the way that people are raised these days? I mean, at least the education system I went through, it was meet these milestones of success. It was graduate high school, graduate university, go get a good paying job, get a house, get a mortgage, get a family, send your kids to college. Never along the way are people um, saying to you, reflect within, um, focus on human development. Do you think that lacks, or do you think that's something you need to obtain through reading? Um, exploring the arts, something like that? Well, I don't know. For each person, it's different. Uh, you know, um, I think when we look to the world, you know, there's a lot of human suffering. And we can't ignore that. You know, there's just a lot of human suffering. And, um, you know, I don't think we can, how can we just go ahead and pursue these dreams of ours without taking into consideration that there's also something else that's very, very important, and that's our humanity and um, how we deal with each other, how we treat each other. Um, uh, you know, the importance of caring for other people. Um, you know, ego. You know, ego is a can be a good thing. It can also be a very ugly thing. Um, I don't know. You know. <laughs> Every you know, life is different. The journey to it, it, it's depending what I, it, I don't know how to say this. It depends what you really want in life. What do you want? You want to become a big star? You can, that, you can do that if you really want. You know, you want to become successful at something? You can do that. If you put you work your butt off and you put all your energy into it, you can achieve it. But I would say, you know, why not? Explore the um, the depths of the human heart. Why not explore the depths of um, what it means to be a human being? Um, explore the depths of feeling. You know, explore the depths of uh, human compassion, understanding, love, tenderness, um, humility. Um, trying to help others. Uh, Trying to find out what it means, truly means, to be a human being. And I think that's an you know, that's a territory that's worth exploring because it's you know look, anybody can climb Mount Everest. I mean they're doing it now, you know, everybody's climbing Mount Everest. Everybody, you know, there, there's lines waiting to get to the top. But I think the ch real challenge is climbing the inner self, the mountain that's within us, 
climbing uh, the heights of uh, inner awareness and and, uh, and understanding. And David, for for a young person, what advice would you would you give me and Peter and, and our audience to do that to to climb the interpersonal stuff and you know learn what learn about ourselves and self reflect and you know what are some is there anything specific that you would recommend trying or doing for for us to begin that road and that path? Well, I think you know. Um, To realize, first of all, that we're not alone. Um, to care for others. Um, to c really care for others. Uh, to be concerned about what's happening in the world. Um, to to have humility. To have compassion. You know, uh, all the great religious uh, or and mystical teachers have all taught the same thing. You know, they've all basically said the same thing, and not, it's never going to change. Um, advice: um, pursue your dreams, go and pursue your dreams, but never forget that there is a purpose to human existence. There is a purpose, um, and find out what that purpose is. Um, because I've understood in my life, it's much more than uh, success, and I've had success. I'm speaking from experience. Um, success is not going to do it. It's never enough. Um, it's just like a drug. You you know you can never get enough of it. Um, Are you to this day still climbing your inner Everest per se? Hmm. Yes. Are you, are you internally still climbing your mountain? I mean, uh, you you've done so much. You, it seems like you've done a lot of internal reflection and and you really climbed that mountain. Are you? Are you still doing it today, or can you sit back and say, "This is great. I'm just gonna, just no. gonna hang." No, 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 no. It's still, it's, I'm doing it every day. Um, you know, it's like I said, uh, human awareness is infinite. It's an infinite thing. What it means to be a human being is uh, the to expand one's consciousness, to expand one's awareness of of the universe is huge. It's huge. You know, I think, you know, the brain and what it can do, we're just exploring a very small part of it. We're experiencing a very small part of it. Um, um, you know, I don't want to sound like I've got all the answers. I don't. I, I, I can only speak from my own experience. My own experience tells me, go ahead and pursue your dreams. Overcome your fears because they're going to come up every time you, you're going to want to pursue your dream. And, and realize the vision for yourself and your life. Every time you do that, fear is going to come up. There's always going to be a part of you that doesn't want to do it because it means sacrifice. It means hard work. It means transforming yourself. It means overcoming the parts of yourself that you don't like or coming to terms with the parts of yourself you don't like. Um, you know, Embracing the shadow parts of yourself. Um, whenever you're pursuing a dream... Um, there's always going to be um, things to overcome. And uh, that's just the way it is. There's no easy way. Mm -hmm. David, I think your, your advice is fantastic. I've, uh, I've gotten the chills several times during the, the last couple questions we've asked you, so I thank you for that. Um, we're coming up on the 45, 50 minute mark, so we don't want to take too much of your time. Um, I have a couple of questions. I know Nick does. We'll kind of do a short answer for these. Um, but uh, to, to go back to what you were saying, speaking from your experience, that's really what we're looking for in each and one of e each and every one of these episodes. Is everyone has a different perspective on on why we're here, what we're doing here, um, what the purpose is, and we're really trying to build a, a collection of those different experiences and opinions and. Um, outlooks, and I, I think it's really great that you um, you noted that that it's your experience and you're speaking within that you don't know if you have the answers, and and that really that really uh, struck a chord with me. So so thank you. Mm. Sure. All right, let me look at my list of questions here. Um, what's the best or most memorable performance you've ever given? Oh God, I can't remember that. I can't remember that. You know, they've all been great. That you know, as a performer, you have good nights, you have bad nights. Do you um, remember a disastrous performance? Um, no, 
No, I don't. That's I remember, good. <laughs> I, I, all I can remember are performances that I, you know, went off stage and went, man, I really suck tonight. Um, and that's that's part of it, you know. But not, I don't, you know, for me, it's, um, I've been very lucky. I've been very lucky. It, it, all the, it's all mem memorable. I mean, all the work that I've done, it's all been a journey um, to make me uh, hopefully master what, what, what I do. Um, you know, the beauty about getting to be my age is giving all of this information to young people now. You know, I have 40, 40 years experience and I've done a lot of different types of theater. So I have a lot of, um, a lot of knowledge about the subject. Um, and what gives me great joy now is helping younger people find their creative spirit, helping them overcome their fears, um, helping them come to terms with um, uh, the difficult challenges that they, they, they face as an artist, um, helping them become human, become more human, because the more human you become, the more you're able to accomplish. And and why it seems like too the um, the role of a clown is very human also in that it's sort of a vulnerable character. Well, yeah, the clown. The beauty of the clown is he's playing. You're playing a misfit. You're playing a character that doesn't fit in. You're playing a character that's is always getting it wrong. He's trying to do it right and he fails. Mm -hmm. And the beauty for an audience is to uh, watch. A character fail again and again and again and laugh. Um, it's you know extremely liberating for the audience um, because they feel like that person deep inside also on some level probably. Well, of right? course. Thank God I'm not the only one, and yeah. um, thank God there's someone there to, you know, because a clown is really revealing human weakness, revealing all of our weaknesses, whatever they are. He mm -hmm. he, he sets them out there in plain view for everybody to see. And uh, that's that's a wonderful thing to be able to do to elicit laughter through, you know, we get to laugh at the parts of ourselves we're normally embarrassed about or ashamed of. And, and, what, and for someone that wants to um, work for Cirque du Soleil or, or become a performer in a circus or a clown, what advice would you give them in in today's world? You mentioned you probably wouldn't recommend being a street performer again. Is there another uh, route that you suggest? I mean, that's a big question, I, I know, but... Um, that's a really hard question to answer, you know, um, because I can say, yeah, go and pursue your dreams, but um, uh, the way I see life now is, is, is very, very different than the way I saw life 30 years ago. Um, in those days when I was young I just I was pursuing something out of a need I wanted to be a great performer I wanted to be a great performer I wanted to be the best that I could possibly be I wanted to establish myself as an original performer I, there was this deep need and drive that drove me uh, towards pursuing this at all costs and um, I missed out a lot on on, on certain things in life because of that. I missed out on being able to relax and just take a walk through the forest and you know, I couldn't, you know, just being able to enjoy the simple things in life, mm -hmm. real things. Because in America, you know, often we can only become somebody when we overachieve. You know, nobody says, hey, you can be happy just having real, a real, really simple, simple life. That's mm -hmm. more challenging than pursuing the, the, the biggest dream you could possibly have. The greater challenge is, can I be happy with the simplest thing there is? Because if you can do that, you're a king. Hmm. If you can just say, you know, I got the little house, I got my job, I enjoy my job, I have people that I love, I care about, they care about me, I love my neighbors, I care about, I care about life, I care about what's going on in the world, um, I like myself, um, and... You know, what's lacking is, as always, there's just never enough real love and compassion and tenderness for all living things. You know, if we could just slow down enough to be able to see that 
happiness and joy is deep, deep within us, it's closer than our own breath, and that we don't need all the shit we think we need. It's very, at the end of the day, it's something very simple. Sitting, you know, on your porch, watching the trees sway in the wind, petting your dog, taking the dog for a walk, walking, the, washing the dishes, uh, you know, shooting the breeze with your neighbors, uh, going to, going to the mall, go, you know, buy some new shoes. Simple stuff. Simple, simple stuff. <laughs> And it's because we don't, the, our hearts aren't open enough. We need to open our hearts. We need to get out the biggest can opener we can find and just crank that thing wide open. <laughs> you know, because op to be open hearted, filled with great compassion and love and tenderness is a great, great achievement. And that's what we should try to pursue. And if we can pursue that, the rest will come. The rest will just come. You know, if I can look back at my life, you know, the regrets I have is that I didn't know this earlier. I didn't know this earlier, that life is much, much simpler than, than, than what I thought it was. I always thought it could only be good by being someone remarkable. But it can be just as good or even better by being someone who's incredibly unremarkable. Hmm. That's brilliant, David. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you've actually answered a lot of my questions, and, and again, this was a, an absolute fantastic experience for both Nick and I, and I think our audience really, really is going to be re able to resonate with a lot of the things that you said. So I want to I want to thank you again for coming on the show today. Um, Nick, if you don't have any other questions, um, I only have one left. I just want to know what's next for David Shiner. What can we expect? Um, well, uh, I, may do, I may do another show for Cirque. Um, I've been working on a movie for a few years, a story about uh, two clowns that uh, have a clown school, and the bank threatens to take it away from them. So uh, they decide to rob the bank to get the money to pay the mortgage. They owe the bank like hundred grand. And they use the students to help them. Of course, all hell breaks loose. It all goes wrong. Um, but I hope to get that movie made in the next couple of years. And, you know, just living life, taking it easy. <laughs> Very cool, Nick. Nick, you have anything else? For yeah, you um, you also really answered a lot of the different questions and thoughts that I had, and um, you know, so far we've we've talked with a lot of um, people more on the business side of things and less on the more creative side of things, and so it was it was really awesome getting your perspective and feedback, um, and especially around the whole concept of achieving because we're I mean I can totally relate to I feel like I can relate to where um, when you were younger and you wanted to be this amazing street performer and clown because I know me and Pete also have this really strong drive to achieve something um, but then at the same time you know we always have these thoughts of well are, are we enjoying our time you know are we working too hard or you know it's just a constant battle of figuring out what that balance is um, so just getting your side and your feedback on that was really awesome. Yeah. But, you know, don't get me wrong. You pursue your dreams. Pursue, you know, do the best you can at what you want to do. Try to do the best you can. But uh, never forget that um, the simple things in life need, are, need to be, you know, that, as you said, there needs to be a balance. There always needs to be a balance. Definitely. Well, yeah, I can I can promise me Pete won't won't forget your feedback on that. And again, thank you very much. It was great doing the interview. I hope you know. I wish you both lots of success with whatever you do in life. Thanks. Thank you, David. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go ahead and end the broadcast so it, it it'll stop recording and then uh, the three of us can chat for a minute or so and then uh, we'll let you go. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit the big red button. Hope everything recorded.